Welcome to Every Sing Podcast. This is episode number six with Marika Schurz on body mapping and the Alexander Technique. This show is about singing from every angle, because singing is as big as the world. And hearing about the driving passion of contributors to music enhances our own love and understanding of singing. This is your host, Nancy Boss. And today's guest, Marika Schurz, is a voice teacher, a fantastic singer, plus She is a licensed Andover educator, which is body mapping, and a certified Alexander Technique teacher. She has a new passion for how our brain interacts with our bodies, but I'll let her explain that better in the podcast. Now, this particular episode with Marika is the first interview that I had ever done for a podcast. And on top of that, the only place that we could find to get away and have this conversation in a relatively quiet place was in a car on a quiet street. So in this podcast, you're going to enjoy uh, some chirping birds, occasionally a car passing by, or small children's voices. Let's just consider that icing on the cake. Anyhow, I hope you enjoy this fascinating interview with Marika, where she unravels and demystifies some of the things that we can benefit from, from body mapping and Alexander Technique. The pain challenges came from muscle compensations, muscles I was tightening. Okay. Okay. The muscle compensations were because I had scoliosis from a childhood injury that had never oh. been addressed. So I unraveled the, the compensations. And you and then, found. And I found I actually had an issue. Wow. Which is not fixable huh. at this point. No. It's just livable with. But wow. I'm like, okay, well, at least I'm not in pain. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm not straight either. <laughs> <laughs> that's just the way I am. So is your, is your okay. spine sideways in the spine? Yeah, spot? from the bottom of my thoracic cavity mm-hmm. all the way into my hips, it can'ts to the right, and okay. it's twisted. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's a big deal. It is a big deal, okay. and it looks like a set of child's blocks that are like this. Oh, can you of... imagine if you'd never addressed that? You'd be I'd... dealing with discs and degeneration. In another 10 years. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. yeah. So I've, I've helped myself oh. a great deal. Big deal. The only thing I ever do is a little bit of Tylenol in the evenings. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Good. So that was my personal journey that ended up coming out of, wow. out yeah. of doing this. Body mapping was designed by an Alexander Technique teacher to be sort of the physical, uh, informational aspect, sort of the ergonomic aspect of Alexander Technique. So it really deals with the nuts and bolts of your structure, your function, your design, and how how to be how to move accordingly, right? Okay. Um, uh, and then that kind of gets all into the um, art kinesthetic awareness, which for some people uh, can be quite um, unreliable and uh, confused. Right. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, some people really don't know what their bodies are doing. And yeah. the, the idea mm-hmm. of kinesthetic awareness and uh, what F.M. Alexander used to call a debauched kinesthesia, <laughs> which is a <laughs> lovely word from the 1920s, uh, um, is one of the five, like, five fundamental principles of Alexander Technique. And then Barb okay. Conable. Which is body mapping. Yeah, okay. who, uh, who um, with her husband, Bill Conable, created... Uh, and over educators and the whole concept of body mapping, okay. which is based on the idea that you have a, a map, a mental map in your mind of what your body's like. Okay. And your use of your body corresponds to your mental map. Right. And so if your mental map is inaccurate, oh. then your use is inaccurate. So I think I'm seeing where, where Alexander leaves off and it turns into body mapping. There was a gap in the understanding or the knowledge or the application that Alexander's technique didn't quite address. Well, in Alexander technique, the, the basis is that you, uh, your system wants to be in good coordination. Okay. And to the extent that it's not, you need help refinding that. And classic Alexander technique, right. though it's morphed a long way yeah. for most teachers, classic okay. Alexander technique, um, The teacher gives you an experience of better coordination, usually through some level of Mm hands-on. And then you go, oh, wow, that's new. Yeah. And then your system sort of over time and over repeated lessons incorporates that. Okay, I've experienced that. Mm -hmm. So uh, body mapping is a lot more informational, and it gives um, 
it gives a little bit more mm. uh, participation on the student's part. Mm -hmm. So you say, well, you know, your, your head really does balance on your spine here. And mm -hmm. if it's off, then this happens. And if you, if you want to bring it back into balance, then this is the direction of bringing it back into balance. And how does that work? And what is that like? Hmm. Because then the, the student can start to facilitate be more aware in general and start to facilitate the process themselves. So do you find that different personality types that you're working with accept the information better from one way or another, the Alexander or the body mapping, or do you meld the two or how do you, what do you do with these two separate schools of information? Well, I'm not the only one that melds them okay. right now. An increasing number of Alexander technique teachers um, take on the body mapping information oh, okay. and incorporate it. That's been a natural progression. It's entirely complementary. They work well together. They really do. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Good. Um, not everybody gets a certification in both. Right. But they do mm -hmm. borrow. Yeah. If you think about Alexander Technique, also has the principles of mind body unity and primary control and some of those yeah. ideas. There, it's it's not theoretical, but it's 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 principles. Yeah. Okay. Upon which then you you create. Uh, learning. So, so pretend I'm, I'm coming here from a place of, yes, I've experienced both of these things. So I know what you're talking about. Okay. Pretend I'm somebody who's like, wait, what, what are we doing? And what is a session like in so an absolute beginner? Yeah, absolutely. Uh -huh. Um, and they realize that maybe there's some tension getting in the way. Where do you go with that? Well, for me, the first thing to do is to, to let them talk for a while because I learn more getting uh -huh. a history about what is concerning them okay. and what um, they, given enough time, usually people understand, they don't know how to get to the new place, but they understand fairly well, though sometimes obliquely and indirectly, uh, what's going on. They okay. just don't understand why or how or how to get out of it, right? Right. So yeah, if, you, yeah. if you let them talk, and sometimes I'll mm -hmm. let them talk, you know, a whole, the whole first lesson practically. And sometimes it's an emotional source rather than a habitual physical sometimes. thing. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Sure. So, uh, you know, from that, you also glean um, whether they're really um, uh, goal oriented driven, uh, whether they're really kinesthetic yeah. and they're, they're um, trying to sense their body all the time, which can create yeah. its own challenges. You, um, or if they're ignorant of their body or if they're totally have no sense of their, uh -huh. <laughs> their physiology and where it is in space at all, Yeah, you know? Yeah. And, and so then that becomes a departure point for how you teach them. Okay. You know, and especially early on, you want to make sure that you're at least acknowledging their desires and goals that bring them in. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because otherwise you're for gonna, sure. Yeah. You, you don't have them. You need to reach their goals with them. Well, it, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So that they hear that you understand why they're there mm -hmm. for their, and then the topic, you know, so I bring that up because usually in that initial discourse, somebody will say, and I know I need trouble with, have trouble with my breathing mm -hmm. or, and my throat is really a problem. Mm -hmm. And I'll say, oh, okay, well, let's, let's take a look at that. What have you learned about that so far? What information? Right. And then I learn where their map is inaccurate by listening to say, oh, well, you know, I was told this and not the other. So, okay. So then I hear the mismapping and then I go, well, so would it make a difference if you knew you know, oh, that your ribs what work a beautiful like way to say that. Like, how do you tell them, did you know your diaphragm is not there? Yeah. <laughs> well, let me show you, let me show you a couple pictures and a video. Would it you help know? you if you knew? Yeah. What a neat way of saying that. And then this works like this and this works like, that. okay, let's see what you do. Oh, I see. So your ribs are moving like this, but there's this element. Oh, and you could include that. And then they're like, Oh, okay. Because then you're helping give them the experience. Uh, they're starting to accept the information. Right. But you first wow. have to create that bridge at the beginning. That must be so exciting. It's fun. Yeah. yeah it's fun. <laughs> it must be. Uh, I mean, just to, to, cause you're really, you're changing not just this person's opportunity to sing better in their section at choir, but, but you're changing how they carry themselves every minute of every day and how they're going to age. Yes, absolutely. The, the fundamental tenet of, of, of Alexander Technique is that you have an overall use of yourself, mm -hmm. right? And it might be really good. It might be really, really poor. Mm -hmm. It might be somewhere in between. It might be a product of um, old activities. Right. It might be a product of injury. 
habitual you know, posture. Habitual posture mm-hmm. for whatever reason. Oh yeah. You know, from things that you do or yeah, or heroes that you watched on TV as a kid well, growing up. Or I anything. know that my dad kind of carries himself hanging off of his shoulders like they're a hanger, and they're as stiff as a hanger. And I admire my dad very much, and so of course I. So the was tendency like that. to want to possibly yeah. do that yourself is high. Yeah, exactly. And then if somebody says, "Well, but your your shoulders are actually designed this way," mm-hmm. and if and they're not let, a hanger. <laughs> yeah. And if you let go just a little bit and let your arms go here or there, and then suddenly and then it doesn't suddenly hurt the anymore. Go, oh and it yeah, hurt they can anymore. breathe. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Oh, I can. So that's my thing. <laughs> <laughs> you got me figured out now. <laughs> so, do you work more with singers or speakers or a combination? At this point, I have. Um, but was pretty funny because, of course, I started off just teaching voice and then I added the body mapping. And by voice, you mean singing? Yes. Yep. Mm-hmm. And then I added the body mapping and then I added the Alexander technique. So I started off and I, I wanted information. You know, right. I started off as a, you know, master's degree in voice, teaching voice, singing opera, blah, 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 hmm. the usual track. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then um, I started having some personal challenges and I was like, OK, ferreting out information, trying to figure out what's going on. And um, I went to something called the Voice Care Network in Minnesota. It's uh, Axel Timer and Leon Thurman. And Leon Thurman at the time was working with Inga Tisa in um, his institute. In Iowa. Way back. Yeah, and they okay. published a book together called Body, Mind, and Voice. Okay. This goes, you know, way wow. before all the current stuff. This was 20, Got it. you know, 19... In the 90s? 98. Okay. Yes, maybe 1998. Cool. So I went there, and that was my first experience with Alexander Technique. The workshop itself, it was a three-day workshop, and um, it was really geared toward choral, choral conductors okay. and some singers. Sure. And, it, and it, there's great information. For instance, if you've got tension in your shoulders and you tend to do a high pattern, guess what? All <gasps> your singers are going to oh, yes. pick up on that tension and breathe high. Yeah. You know, Absolutely, and all these kinds of details, which really mirroring, t- yeah, exactly, yeah. which really showed how much you t- you inadvertently telegraphed okay. when you were in front of a group, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and you couldn't get away with doing one thing and saying another because oh, yeah. the students will the visual is stronger. It, yeah, yeah, they will do what you do, not what yeah. you say, right? And so I was like, oh, this is fabulous, and I went back the next year to another workshop, and I thought I have to find this in my area. And so I started researching, and the name that popped was Barbara Conable. Okay. Here in, um, she had just moved to Portland to be with her grandchildren. I was teaching. I had two small children, uh, you know, da 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 da, and I'm two hours away. Oh. So I would come up once a month wow. to work with her and do her workshops. And finally, she said, "You should do my body mapping certification." It was just a brand new pilot thing that she was doing. Huh. It wasn't even Andover Educators yet. It okay. was just Barbara okay. and a handful of people. Wow. So I said, "Okay, I'll do it." And so we worked on that for a while. And and uh, in 2006, I got that certification. And she was just about ready to retire at that point. Uh huh. We had a couple of really fun times. I stayed over. She loves jazz oh. and drinking wine. <laughs> <laughs> so we do that. Things, you know, share plants, those kinds of things. And, and it was after I, I went, uh, she retired and I went looking for a new teacher. Of course, this whole time I'm learning about myself and figuring out where yeah. you know, my challenges were. Because that, that's yes. what started me in the first place. And your family. I mean, I'm sure you're, you're looking right. around at everybody you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Of course, my girls got benefits. Early, oh, yeah. On, Absolutely. Right? That's right. <laughs> So anyway, then I ended up going up to Seattle, working with Kathy Madden. She's amazing. Cool. And then um, after her, after I worked with her for again, part time. So you were going oh, up to Seattle? Yeah, I was. Yeah, so that's how that's five hours from your house. Yeah, yeah every okay. every uh, like five times a year, and I'd stay overnight. My 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 dedicated husband would drive me up there, <laughs> hang out and wait for me, drive me home, oh. so I wouldn't get too fatigued. You know. Oh. He was a trooper. When somebody was watching the kids, so it was yeah. like date night. Yeah, exactly. It was date weekend. Date weekend. Yeah, exactly. And then I had one more set of teachers, which is uh, Catherine Ketrick and David Mills. Wow. As, were, after all this time and experience with it, and you were still looking for teachers. Yeah, because I felt like I hadn't grasped it. So you had more to unravel than a lot of people with that injury in your spine. Yeah, and the funny thing is, is that you do sometimes, especially when you, uh, since I started with the body mapping, you see all these skeletons and parts and stuff like that yeah. um, models and you assume you're straight yeah you just yeah you assume that your back that... is the same as everybody else's yeah yeah 
or th- or that you would have known about it. Yeah, of course. Right. Yeah. So discover so to discover what six years ago, discover at fifty. Ah, oh, right. That, six years ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That, that you're not okay. That's why I could never pirouette to the left. I can only pirouette and dance class to the right. So is there any option of going to a chiropractor or anybody else who would, is it just, it's a done deal now? Well, the thing is that I was 13. Yeah. So I was growing yeah. very quickly. Yeah. So the bones have molded to that. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So it is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. So what next for you with this? I, I'm enjoying the heck out of teaching the combination of things. So you really join it together in combination with other stuff. Well, I still see a lot of voice oriented. Singing, yeah. I mean, okay. sometimes I have a few that I don't. I've had I've had an instrumentalist come in. Oh, of course. I'm starting to do more with um, Alexander Technique with, well, uh, let me backtrack. The, the Andover Educators body mapping thing initially was designed as an educational tool for including in the, the musician's studio. In other words... To include body mapping information in when you're teaching a student guitar. Yeah, some instruments student, are really unbalanced, like a violin. Well, sure is, they are, and, and yeah. And so you have to um, you have to learn to accommodate mm-hmm. the instrument to the to the best of your ergonomic yeah. options. Yeah. And not just do it any old which way, otherwise you end up with with challenges. Mm-hmm. And so if you're going to do it for hours every week, exactly. then yeah, that's the premise of the Andover Educators. It's specifically mission. for musicians. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I do see quite a few, and I've, most of the workshops and stuff I've done over over time have been for, I did one whole one for flutists, one whole one for harpists, and one whole one for, for saxophonists. That was fun. And what instruments do you play? I just play piano and a little guitar. Okay. And sing. Yeah. Yeah. Transference of weight and ergonomics is is what it is. That must be fascinating to get into those other instrumentalists' bodies and experience what they're experiencing. Yeah, and, and I engage them in it. You know, I remember one time... I was working with the woodwinds, with the winds over at the OVO, and, and this one little tiny girl who was playing, t- what, tenor, tenor or berry sax? Mm-hmm. Right. I love the sound, but that picture. I'm, I'm seeing Lisa Simpson <laughs> with this jacket. Yeah, you know, like a 100-pound female <laughs> and this 80-pound instrument. And so we had to divide. We, we really went on this whole exploration of how are you going to assimilate the weight of this yeah. instrument into your pelvic structure, into your legs, into your feet, wow. and not into the small of your back? Right. So that you can you can sustain this instrument. Did you find a way? Yeah, yeah. We improved it. That's amazing. I mean, she might still have to... Um, it's still a poor fit. It's yeah. still... <laughs> She might have to limit the number of hours she plays at a time. Or but... <laughs> sit. Or sit or something. Okay. Yeah. Huh. But it was her choice. Yeah. She, she might decide something. Probably later. carries it in marching band, too. Holy smokes, right? <laughs> Yikes. That's the things people do. Wow. And then what about um, business people, speakers that aren't caring about music? Do you work with that group, too? You know, I have an executive right now. But, you know, even the most um, diehard mm-hmm. business person usually has, when you get them to talking, mm-hmm. they usually like, oh, but I also do yoga, or I also run, or I also this, or I also Is that, that. helpful if they run? Does that help? In general, running. Yeah. It depends on how they run. Yeah, I was going to say, yoga, I can see, you pretty much have to do yoga right. It's Well, you can do yoga incorrectly. Can you? And, and we, we, <laughs> we veered off that topic, but let's swing back around. Okay. If your um, if your general use or your general coordination mm-hmm. is poor, okay. right, then it affects everything you do, and everything you do is more arduous, more mm-hmm. labored, and it um, puts more pressure on the joints. Mm-hmm. So the more you can bring somebody into not just better balance, mm-hmm. but um, easier, smoother coordination, mm-hmm. then everything they do becomes more fluid. Right. They're piano playing, they're running, right. they're yoga, their tennis swing, their tennis swing, mm-hmm. everything. It's across the board. Yeah. And that's, that's the fundamental pr- principle of the Alexander technique is that you improve the core use and then everything else yeah. gets affected out of that. Okay. Yeah. Got it. So back to the question of mm-hmm. what's next for you. I don't know. Just going to keep riding this and see what happens. <laughs> I don't know. Um, one of the things that David Mills and Catherine Ketrick, uh, mm-hmm. the th- one of the things that I appreciate so much about them was they, um, they went, I don't want to say, they kind of really went into the theoretical side. Okay. If there's a theoretical side to the Alexander technique. Okay. Right. 
And so this idea has been brewing about the Alexander Technique being literally its own type of pedagogy. It's a learning how to learn process. Really? And that is just starting to take off. And I so want to be wow. in, in that topic. Can you go a little deeper for me? I don't quite understand. <laughs> You're looking at me like, well, of course you don't understand. <laughs> well, because it's a relatively new thing. Yeah. What if most of your job in any teaching situation is not simply to teach whatever it is you teach, but to teach the student how to learn Okay. so that they get out of their own way? Isn't that kind of what the body mapping is doing? You're teaching them how to learn with body mapping? You're teaching them information with body mapping. Oh. And, and that is increasing their awareness. Okay. But there's a process of learning, mm -hmm. right? And um, when we have the regional conference coming up, and I had this thing on changing habits, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's going to be in my little blurb. Yeah. So that kind of gets into it. How do you take a habit that's unconscious All right. and packed neatly into something like singing or brushing teeth oh, or okay. whatever it is that you do that becomes not a series of steps, but a composite whole okay. in your, in your act, as an activity? Right. And how do you take that apart if it's faulty yeah. right. to fix the components and right. then put it back together. I really like the brushing to... teeth analogy. That one makes sense to me. I remember being surprised that I had to teach my babies how to brush their teeth. It's like, don't people just know how to do this? Right. And you could teach it wrong. You could. Okay. Yeah, so, absolutely. So unpacking that. Yes. Yeah, so you unpack the habit. Uh-huh. Right. And I'm giving away my little 15 minute blurb. But That's okay. That, right? <laughs> they can hear it seven more times. There you go. Right. <laughs> so unpacking the habit. So here you have this thing called brushing teeth and it includes up and down and sideways and tongue. Mm -hmm. and, down. and when you were three or mm -hmm. two, mm -hmm. you learned all the steps, maybe, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you did them well or sloppily or mm -hmm. too hard or whatever, but this became it, and for a while you had to really pay attention. Oh yeah, mom says, oh yeah, mommy says, oh hmm. yeah, and mom's going, remember the oh, bottom, yeah. and Don't remember forget the back, the back. <laughs> and oh, you have to, and child, let me check, you know, Yeah. And then, but then after a while, it coalesces into something called brushing teeth, and you think, I'm going to brush my teeth, Right. and then your brain goes off on your day while yeah. you brush your teeth, and you walk through all the steps. Got it. Well, so singers come in with the same thing. They mm -hmm. have this package that they call singing. Oh, yes. Right? Yes. And I've seen this, it. especially working with um, my students who are professionals who are midlife or beyond. And, and, and actually with amateurs, too. They develop their singing habits when they exactly. were in their 20s, and now they're in a different body. They're in a 50-year-old's body or a 60-year-old's body. Is that So that aging is what I'm referencing, but you're talking maybe everybody. I'm talking any kind of habit. You mm -hmm. can have a 17-year-old a come in with... She listened to singers on YouTube and she emulated them and she formed yeah. habits that she considers to be singing. Right. And kinesthetically, uh -huh. she looks for a kinesthetic feel huh. that she calls singing. And if it's not there, she does, doesn't consider it singing. Yeah. So... First, there's awareness and helping them understand what a habit is because okay. sometimes they don't want to unpack the box. Right. They don't want to look at the components. Mm -hmm. And they don't really want to necessarily change the habit that they Because call the sound that they're hearing is what they identify as core to their personality. And S you're, sometimes. you're risking changing their essence. It right. might feel like that. Of course, we know from experience now that isn't true. It's just opening up the treasure box that was always there that they didn't know they had. And a more mature singer, in some ways, is more inclined to go that route because they're 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 a little more seasoned at life, and not always, but in general, if they're mm -hmm. if they're a little bit older, a sixteen or a seventeen year old can feel quite threatened. Oh yeah. If you ask them to unpack their habit of singing. So, of course, you know, teachers find ways yes, we to go do. around it. We, we go, well, let's not call it singing. Let's yeah. call it. <laughs> We're just going to make some noises. Let's, this is going to be ugly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not anything. It's not definitely not singing. <laughs> I never want you to sing like this in public, ever. Now, let's do this. <laughs> yeah, right. Just because, and, and there's a valid point to that idea because um, the word singing becomes the trigger for the habit. In other words, on a neurophysical level, okay. as soon as they think the habit of think of singing, their system goes into a whole series of neuromuscular responses into the habit or the pattern that they've developed. Okay. Okay. Got it. So, and you can, um, our bodies do that all the time. You can uh, press on a little spring mm -hmm. and you can think about releasing the spring. Okay. And your system will start to 
release your fingers without you moving anything. Oh. And you can see it. Because everything's going, oh, let's put everything in place because she's about to release the spring. Oh. So let's put all our coordinations into that okay so the process so the 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 habit starts so fast after the trigger word Mm -hmm. right that literally sometimes they can't stop it okay they can't stop going into the habit right right conscious thought can't react as quickly right yeah hence the using a different word yeah okay and sometimes you can um there's a very alexander technique thing that you can do to teach them to be aware of that moment before they start okay okay you can have them um, think about singing okay. and then decide not to sing. Oh. And then think about singing again okay. and then say, oh, but I'm not going to sing. I'm just going to stand here <laughs> and go back and forth. And they'll start to notice in their systems that little gearing up. The lining that up. Lead, that, oh. li- that leads to the habit. I can just imagine that. And when you can do that, then, <laughs> then, they're, then they know the place in time where they have to stop the old habit in yeah. order to go down a new track and choose a new wow. process of doing something. I'm, I'm totally using this this week. And every, no. everybody who's listening to this is at home going, I'm about to sing. No, I'm not. I'm about to sing. No, I'm not. <laughs> and it's, and when Alex, FM Alexander was in front of his mirrors trying to figure out why he pulled back and down in his system to, oh, to yeah. because he was an actor mm-hmm. and his primary challenge was with his voice right. and a habit of use that he had developed when speaking that mm-hmm. caused, that caused tension through his system that caused him to lose his voice when he was reciting. So he did this very thing. And this is like, again, it's one of these core things of Alexander technique. He's like, if I think of singing, think of speaking in mm-hmm. this case. Speaking Shakespeare, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. He was a Shakespearean actor and recitalist. If I think of speaking and then I, I just, then I don't. And if you think of speaking, it's not enough because you have to have the contrast with not thinking of speaking. <laughs> yeah. In order to feel, to notice the difference mm-hmm. in your system. Nice. And it's very subtle. And then you just play there for a little while. Love it. You know, and once that, moment in time is created that moment of awareness then you can and then because we spend so much of our time training a new habit into our a new habit of singing into our you know first do this 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 is good singing breath mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. da, mm-hmm. and then you say okay let's sing the song and out comes the yeah. old habit like uh-huh. instantly instantly yeah. yeah so they have to have that moment in time of awareness wow. which happens before they sing it happens in the start of the breath before they start the so, phrase. It, yeah. Do you, so do you do that with pretty much every student you've got? It depends on what level they are, but I go there mm-hmm. with every student I've mm-hmm. got. Okay. I, I take them there depending on, you know, how willing they are. To yeah. yeah. Sometimes it takes a little while and I have to be indirect about it. It's it's not very active and some people really want to be active. Right. Yeah. Right, right, right. Okay. So then you do different things for them. But the mm-hmm. goal is to create, sooner or later you get that teaching moment to yeah. teach that. Yeah. Sooner or later it shows up. And then you're like, now yeah. that's a very good moment to decide to do our new singing idea rather you know, than the habit. Now that brings up something I've been thinking about lately is that the student who comes in interested in learning and, and shedding it all and there to absorb is such a different student than most students. Most students come in feeling like they know pretty much everything. They just need the last few pieces of the puzzle. And that's a tough one. That's when they're there. tough. Yeah. And, and occasionally, weirdly enough, I've never understood this. I'll get a student who really thinks his puzzle is complete. Notice I said his. So it, could, it could maybe be a girl. Is it ever a girl? But it, at any rate, oftentimes, men, the puzzle is complete. And so why did you pay tuition to come and do this? But at any rate, I see what you mean about those, those teachable moments. But if you can get a student who comes in saying, here I am, I'll take whatever you're giving yeah, out. Those are so much fun. They're so special. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it's a benefit. I mean, my studio name is Kantari Studio Voice and the Alexander Technique. And so it's, it's really a benefit to have the Alexander Technique on there because mm-hmm. I, I attract more of those. Mm-hmm. People who are ready it. to receive the information. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's very cool. So that's that's nice for me. Wow. So if there was one thing that um, somebody's listening to this and they're like, wow, that was really fascinating. How can I make a difference in my life without traveling out to Corvallis to see Marika? What, what do you recommend that a person can do? right this minute to improve their kinesthetic, um, I don't know, can I say their posture, their... 
Their quality of use. Quality of use. Thank you. Their quality of use. When you are moving well according to your structural muscular design, okay, right, then the quality of your movement becomes easier, lighter, and more fluid, as opposed to heavier, mm-hmm. um, um, rigid or awkward, mm-hmm. right? So sometimes you can start to experiment simply by going, "I'm going to move." Mm-hmm easily and lightly yeah. it doesn't it doesn't do you any real benefit to move with extra work so now because i've had experienced a little bit of alexander and a little bit of body mapping the minute you said that then i started to you started kind of to stack shift. up my spine a little bit differently uh-huh. and so really just experiencing this even for a half hour with a practitioner can really help a person understand right feel it understand it a little bit well, and, and you do have whatever your... Everyone, if I said, here, shake my hand. Okay. Okay. That's a strong handshake. Yeah. That's yeah. a really soft handshake. Oh, yeah. I hate those. Right? And there's yep. something in between. Mm-hmm. Right? That's a so friendly it's, one. So it's yep. playing with quality of... Oh. Of, it's a kinesthetic quality of ease. Mm-hmm. Right? I could pick up um, I could pick up my phone mm-hmm. with a really strong grip. Yeah. Why but bother? I, but why bother? It's yeah. not that heavy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right? Uh-huh. So it's understanding... It's playing around with, well, how much, how, how hard do I have to grip the steering wheel? Right. Well, I don't have to grip it that hard. New to drivers. Steer the car, yeah, yeah. You know, and how, um, how much effort do I need to put into whatever mm-hmm. it is, washing the dishes, anything like that? You can right. play around with quality of use. Anytime you put tension into part of your system, mm-hmm. it translates to some extent into all of your system. Boy, it does. You squeeze your toes, you can feel That's it all the way up your right. body. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. So even if you're just playing with, I'm going to be really easy with how I use my hands, mm-hmm. you know, even if you're not something special like oh, a pianist, yeah. but yeah. just, you know, things yep. around the house, I'm going to be really easy with how I, and it doesn't mean droopy or, um, mm-hmm. huh, you know, falling over. It doesn't mean that. It means, it means a quality of, um, efficiency, gent- gentleness, gentleness. So what would you say to the person who's standing on the bus right now on the way into work Mm -hmm. and they've got their headphones in and they're listening to this podcast. What can they do at this moment? And what should the next step be? Let's see if you're standing on a bus with your headphones in and you're listening. The first thing to check is, is there a lot of tension in the back of your neck? Mm -hmm. Because if there's tension in the back of your neck, that means that your head spine relationship is off balance. Okay. So if you can think about where does my head need to go so that my neck muscles can release a little bit more so that my back can open up so Mm. that my torso can lengthen and widen. This feels great. (laughs) So that I can balance through my hip joints and mm-hmm. through my legs to my feet. Okay. That would be a start. You could, you could, <laughs> it sounds like everything. <laughs> well, it kind of is. It's a little litany that just yeah. goes head to toe, ah. you know, yep. looking for ease. Mm-hmm. And and you don't always know which direction you're, you're pulled off in. Yeah. You know, where you're you know pulled what? down. I like the physical gesture you did with that with, with your, your fingers kind of... I don't know, waving. It kind of reminded me of a, of a transformer from the movie, you know, <laughs> it kind of everything stacking up and lining it up into the next shape. Yeah. How can they learn more about body mapping or Alexander? Which one should they start with? Is there an association to get in touch with? Well, there's, um, there's three main Alexander technique organizations. Um, Alexander technique international, which is the one I'm, um, associated with, uh, Amstat, American Society for Teachers of the Alexander Technique, and okay. NASTAT, hmm. National Alexander, I forget. Okay, that's something fine. like that. One of those. <laughs> They're going to be so mad and, at you. And they all, I know, right? <laughs> and they all have directories online. Okay. If you want to find an Alexander Technique teacher near you, got it. Um, Andover Educators is the body mapping organization. Okay. And they have a website. Okay. For body mapping cool. people near you. Find a practitioner and go in and take a session and see how it speaks to you. Yeah, there's there's really good books. Um, Barbara, can you learn this from a book? You can you can learn some of the ideas, uh-huh. but you can't get the experiences. No, because you have to be you have to you have to feel it. You can't go somewhere you haven't been. Right, right. That's a that, yeah, that's role. it. Yeah, that's a teacher's role yep. is to give you an, an experience or or. Um, 
an example mm -hmm. of something new so that mm -hmm. you can head towards it mm -hmm. and experiment until you head towards it. Mm -hmm. So an Alexander Technique teacher or body mapping person is going to help you get that new experience mm -hmm. and then you can continue to play with it on your own and, f and but at least mm -hmm. then you know where you're going. Yeah. If you don't know where you're going, how are you going to go? At least there? that door's been opened for you. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Cool. All right. Well, okay. thank you so much. My pleasure. Fantastic. What a great conversation with Marika about the differences between body mapping and Alexander Technique and how they can enhance our lives. It was fascinating to note that at the beginning, the teacher has to build a bridge from the student's understanding to what body mapping can teach. Marika also said the fundamental tenet of Alexander is that you have an overall use of yourself. It might be really good, really poor, or somewhere in between, from things that you do or habitual postures. If your general use is poor, it affects everything you do, and everything you do is more arduous, more labored, and puts pressure on the joints. So the more you can bring somebody into easier, smoother coordination, then everything they do becomes more fluid. Improve the core use, and then everything else gets affected after that. In improving physical technique, unpack the habit. What are the little steps? The word singing becomes the trigger for the habit. On a neurophysical level, as soon as they think of singing, the system goes into a whole system of neurological responses. Our bodies do that all the time. The habit starts so fast that sometimes it can't be stopped. To teach a singer to be aware of the moment before they start, ask them to think about singing, but don't start. Then do it again and again and notice the habits. It gives them the opportunity to stop the habit and create new ones. So the notes and the links from this conversation, they can be easily found on the show's Facebook page, which is a public group called Every Sing Podcast. Before I wrap up, I want to thank Teodora at teodorabeauty.com for sponsoring today's episode. Take advantage of their generous offer of 25% off to discover their terrific products. Teodora's natural products are inspired by ancient Brazilian beauty secrets using natural anti-aging ingredients from the Amazon rainforest. They are toxin-free, ethically sourced, sustainably harvested, gluten-free, and made in the U.S. For your 25% off discount, and believe me, you're going to want that. The Teodora stuff is not inexpensive. Use the Teodora discount word, EVERYSING, all one word, when you check out. So you can go to the Facebook group, EVERYSING Podcast, three words to get the notes and the links from this episode. And while you're there, join the group to get advance notice of what podcasts are coming up. If you like what you're hearing on Every Sing, do me a favor and tell your friends. This podcast is a blast to make and it's a blast to share. And I know that a lot of people will enjoy hearing the wide variety of stories that are going to be told in this podcast, episode after episode after episode. People who are all passionate about music, all passionate about singing, not necessarily the singers in all cases, but people who want to support the singing. People who realize how important singing is in our world, to ourselves, to our relationships, to communication to world peace, or just peace within yourself. Singing is so much, and I'm so excited to share this podcast where this variety of different passions for this field come out from these brilliant people. So tell your friends, tell the people that you know that are musicians or even not musicians. I know everybody's going to love hearing where these amazing musicians and supporters are coming from. Thank you so much for joining me for this conversation with Marika. I hope you got as much out of it as I did. See you for the next show.